This is the current federal tax developments for the week of May 15th, 2017, brought to you by the Los Galzo Institute. Current federal tax developments, we take a look at this every week. The Los Galzo Institute and your state society of CPAs help us look at what's been going on in the area of federal taxes. And this week, in addition to taxes, we're going to take a brief look at what's been going on in the IT arena because that may have a significant effect on many of you. So we want to kind of talk about that. The quick overview on that issue, if you haven't been applying updates because you didn't want to risk crashing your system in tax season, applying an update and finding out it doesn't work with your software, you might want to start up this broadcast right now and go get up to date on your patches because otherwise you might find that uh, due to the fact somebody in your network opened up an attachment on an email that all the drives on your that all of the files on your network drives have suddenly become encrypted and you're being asked to pay a ransom not a good result so obviously a key issue in the tax arena we're going to talk about the following cases the third circuit found a way to dodge having to discover having to determine if they're going to follow what's called the one day late rule for bankruptcy issues uh, the IRS adds to get transcript features to looking at your account information page on the IRS website. A taxpayer finds that relying on the IRS's date for when you have to file in tax court may not be the best thing you could do. There are some problems if you do that. And finally, we have a field attorney advice uh, that took a look at whether a taxpayer could apply deposits that they had placed for their account for the benefit of another presumably related taxpayer and have that still count as a deposit. So we'll take a look at the IRS's view on that point. So got all of that neat stuff coming. Now, we are in the time of the year where we're gonna start doing our professional education courses. They're in full swing. We have courses coming up in Missoula, Montana, the first week of June. Uh, Rebecca Lee will be going to Missoula that week. On June the 3rd, she'll be presenting a course on practice issues and updates for audits of employee benefit plans. On June the 6th, there'll be a governmental update course. And on June the 7th, understanding and testing internal controls. Now, especially that audit employee benefit plans course, if you do that sort of thing, realize that you know there's been a lot of concern about quality of audits in that area, a lot of concerns about issues the Department of Labor has in that area. So you wanna make sure you're definitely up to speed there. And as well, if you work in government or you have issues, you know, and anybody, I think, even if you're not an auditor, if you're just an inside accountant, the idea of trying to figure out how to understand and test proper internal controls for your system, all of those are significant. If you're interested in any of these courses, you can register at the Montana Society of CPAs website. They're at mscpa.org. So if you're either in the Missoula area or you just like to come there because, hey, it's going to be early June in Missoula. The weather should be wonderful. You know, the skies are big. There's lots of lots of room, lots of area, a lot of things to see in the area. You can go ahead and head out there. So go ahead, go to the, go to the Montana website, mscpa.org, and you can sign up for those courses. As I mentioned, one problem we got this week is that we have a major problem occurring in the IT arena. And that is the current uh, problem that has been labeled, a bit of ransomware, labeled the WannaCry ransomware. That ban it began spreading very rapidly on May the 12th. It uses as one of its vectors for spreading, once it gets inside of a network, it gets inside your firewall, a vulnerability that was published in a leak from the NSA that they had been, that they were aware of. Microsoft has patched this problem but if you haven't been applying patches, you may have a problem with it spreading. Now, again, the Microsoft patch, Microsoft did not put ransomware into Windows. What's happening, though, is the ransomware is using a problem that was patched in order to spread itself once it gets inside a network. The particular problem that Microsoft was looking at was covered in Microsoft Security Bulletin MS-17010. The patch and the documentation were published in mid-March. March 14th is when this came down of this year. So it's been available for what for almost two months at this point, the patch to occur. But as we discovered yesterday, it turns out that a number of places didn't have patches yet. Now, in some cases, that might be because they were using a version of Windows that Microsoft no longer issues security patches for, Windows XP. 
or it might be because they just don't patch when Microsoft originally issued software. They want to study the patches. Well, if your study is taking you more than two months or you're just not patching because you don't want to risk shutting down your system, period, if it works, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, these people may be able to break it for you. So you should be aware of the problem. The problem that occurs in the case of this particular ransomware, if your version of Windows is not up to date, occurs not the initial infection. The initial infection can occur whether or not you've done this patch. It generally is an email attachment that has a payload with it. The attachment, this is a standard problem we have with attachments. You know, it looks like invoices. It looks like an Excel sheet. It looks like a Word file. It comes from somebody that you think you know, you know, that you know. So you open this thing and voila, your system is compromised. But once your system downloads and executes this payload, the software, in addition to running its ransomware stuff on your machine, goes out and looks for machines on your network that have this vulnerability that Microsoft patched back in March that have not been fixed. And if you have not fixed those things, you know, if you don't have this patch in place, the vulnerability is there, it simply puts itself on those machines. No action needed by the user. The user could be totally away from the machine. Never touch the machine. It's still going to be infected and it's going to take over. It's going to be able to run through and start encrypting drives. It will encrypt every file it can have access to. That will include network drives, which is where the problem occurs. So even if it comes in the door on a machine that let's say has no access to your files for your tax returns, your work papers and all that stuff, it's just, you know, the receptionist machine who uses it, you know, for some light typing and stuff. If it, if it ends up on that machine, it will start looking for other people like the partners who have a machine that has not been patched and it will infect that machine and then go out and take over and go after your network. You may say, oh, I've got antivirus. Gang, this stuff is tested against all modern antiviruses before it goes out and is modified constantly. If it gets in your system, you've just got problems. You cannot, you have an issue. And especially if it can get in your systems and start worming its way through a bunch of other systems, on, a bunch of other computers on your network. This will not be a good time when that happens to you. So you want to make sure you've done this. Now, Microsoft has, as we said, patches, uh, all supported versions of Windows. Windows XP is not supported uh, as of, you know, as of basically a few months ago. So that was vulnerable automatically, as were any systems that you weren't patching automatically. So if any systems in your office do not have updates applied automatically, any systems in your office are running XP or similar unsupported versions of Windows, you have a problem. Saturday, Microsoft did release a special patch for Windows XP. Remember, they weren't updating it for security problems. Microsoft decided this is serious enough they're going to do so. This has hit entities that are relatively large as well. Look, it was reported on Friday that FedEx in the U.S. has been hit by this. Currently, the largest numbers of hits are in Russia, uh, but there have been major hits on the continent of Europe. Hits have now been reported going into Africa, and we are seeing some in the U.S., and there's little reason to believe they won't spread rapidly within the U.S., that we'll start seeing this malware, you know, get a foothold in the U.S. and start moving here. So if you've not done updates, now is the time to talk with your IT guy about, okay, is it now time to consider how quickly we apply patches? We have had a whole bunch of things leaked from the security agencies, we are now seeing that stuff being weaponized. It may not be, you may no longer have the luxury of waiting three, four, five, six months to apply security patches because these guys aren't gonna wait three, four, five, six months. And yeah, the patch might break your system. But if this gets in, your system is broken, period. This isn't a might, this is a, it's gonna be really bad. So just be aware, you need to be careful and you know consider whether you need to reconsider what you've done previously for applying patches on systems. Let's go next to bankruptcy. Hey, another upbeat topic. As you're probably aware, some tax debts can be discharged in bankruptcy, right? We're aware of that fact. You have to file a return and you have to wait a certain period of time, etc. Now, the Bankruptcy Act of 2005 
did modify and add the special definition of what's a return because you have to have filed a return and this defines what a return is in order for that discharge to be possible for the debt. This is a complex area. So if you're ever in this area, number one thing I want you to take away from this before we get started is advice from competent bankruptcy counsel is mandatory when you're in this area. You know, you've been trained in tax. If you're not an attorney and even attorneys who don't practice in bankruptcy, this is a very specialized area. You want to make sure that you get, you know, you tell the client to get the advice from somebody who actually has the background to do this. That said, it's always good to have a basic understanding of how these things work. And we're going to take a look at what has been called the one day rule. This is the case of Thomas Giacci versus United States. It's a third circuit case, case number 15-3761. The opinion was issued on May the 5th. Three circuit court of appeals. What the catch is, the bankruptcy law as now written uh, defines a return. And one of the definitions for something to be a return of the bankruptcy law now is that it has to satisfy the return, has to satisfy the requirements of the applicable non bankruptcy law, including applicable filing requirements. The key question has become what's meant by applicable filing requirements? Three circuits, the first, the fifth, and the tenth, have decided that, you know, the Internal Revenue Code provides for a date to file the return. That date, you know, including extensions, because that's provided for by the law too, but that date, including re extensions you actually got, you have to file by that date. If you don't file by that date, you've not met the applicable filing requirements. Only those three circuits have said, so essentially they have what we'll call the one day late rule. If you file that return one day late, you cannot get the debt discharge. The third circuit hadn't ruled on that yet, but Thomas had clearly filed his return late. So we're going to talk to you about our problem here with Thomas. Now, Thomas, his problem was that he had returns for 2000, 2001, and 2002. That he just didn't really file very quickly. In fact, what he did in all three cases was he waited for the IRS to issue a substitute for return and assess tax. Then he finally sent in a revised return, and the IRS abated the tax and you know abated a portion of the tax and billed him for the rest. Now, Thomas wasn't paying, you have to understand, what was being billed. So a few years later, Thomas goes and tries to get a discharge in bankruptcy of this liability. The question becomes, can Thomas get a discharge? Obviously, if the one-day late rule applies, there is no way he gets a discharge. And the Third Circuit had never decided that issue. So will they decide it here? Third Circuit decided they could sidestep that issue entirely. If they can find another reason why Mr. Why Thomas's return doesn't qualify as a return for bankruptcy purposes, then they don't have to do the one-day rule. They found that reason. Looking to the law that took place before the 2005 Bankruptcy Act, they went to look at the Beard case. In the Beard case, we looked at what was a return before we saw that definition. And one of the requirements for a return to be considered valid under the Beard requirements was that it had to represent an honest and reasonable attempt to comply with the tax law. The problem in this case was, you know, the court said, look, waiting for the IRS to contact you, prepare a substitute for return, assess tax, and then filing a return is simply not a reasonable attempt to comply with the law. And as such, Thomas, this is not a return under pre-2005 Bankruptcy Act law, so it's just simply not valid. We don't have to decide whether or not the one day late rule could apply here. We're just going to use this. The flip side of that is obviously the takeaway is this is complex and it's an area where the circuits may not agree. If you have a, an individual that comes to you who has unpaid tax debts and who may be looking to eventually get a discharge in bankruptcy, they need to be told to go seek competent bankruptcy counsel and this, the details of their tax debt and these and the issues and developments have to be followed to make sure we understand what debts may be eligible for discharge and what the taxpayer needs to do or not do to make this situation work for their benefit to be you know to get the best benefit from this next up the irs has a view your tax account information page and until this past week, that had information about what you owed for a year and what you had paid in the last 18 months, that sort of information. So we could find that up. If you wanted to go to that site, you had to register for the page. 
and you had to, quote, prove your identity. Now, as we discovered last year, that proof of identity that the IRS had as of last year wasn't exactly the most robust. It turned out it could be spoofed. We'll have to wait and see whether this works as well, but for now, let's assume it does. So we go to the basis of you still, though, on that page had no ability to access full transcripts. What's going to happen now is the IRS has changed the page to grant us access to transcripts on that page. So that particular page, which is your view your tax account information page, its address, and uh, hopefully you can get a look in the materials or in our slides because other, writing this down will be a little bit tough, but it's www.irs.gov slash UAC slash view dash your dash tax dash account, all lowercase. It was changed on May the 8th. Now you can get transcript information. Now remember, a taxpayer that wants to do this still has to go through the registration process. That registration process still is going to require them to have a cell phone in their name with their name on the account. That may cause problems if you have one of these families where we've put dad and all five adult kids on a family plan. Uh, you know, the adult kids may not be able to register this way. You'll also need a personal account number from a credit card, mortgage, home equity loan, home equity line of credit, or a car loan. I suspect the credit card will be the easiest one to grab. Uh, your filing status and mailing address from the last tax return that was filed, your date of birth, and Social Security number. Also realize this tool is not open all, all around the clock. Generally, it closes down somewhere around midnight, a little bit earlier on Saturday night, doesn't reopen till 6 a.m., so if you have one of those people that likes to do things at three in the morning, you have to warn them if they want to use this and get their transcript, they can't do that at three in the morning because it won't be available in that, in that case. Next up, we're going to take a look at the issue of filing a petition in tax court. There's a set date. In most cases, the statute provides for a date. There are various things you can file in tax court for, and the applicable statute will tell you when you have to file it. So that date is set. Most often it's 90 days from some action of the IRS. The IRS often will reference that date in correspondence. So, you know, if they've denied your request for innocent spouse relief, they'll say you have a right to file a petition in tax court and you must file that petition by a certain date. But if the IRS gives the wrong date, a date after the actual date for filing, can the taxpayer in reliance on that date still file in tax court by that date? That was the key question we had to look at this week. You know, it would seem equity says you should be able to use that date. But the problem that you're going to discover is as comes up, this is a third circuit again with the case of Rubel versus Commissioner, case number 16-3526, issued on May 9th. If does the court have jurisdiction? And what the third circuit is going to tell us is if it's a jurisdictional issue, there is no equitable relief allowed. The IRS had issued a final determination of denial of instant spouse release to Ms. Rudell. Ms. Rudell, in a follow-up letter, she sent additional information. They looked at information, decided they still didn't think she qualified for relief. But in that follow-up letter, they said, we've, we've decided you don't qualify for relief. We'll consider any more information you give us, but you have to file. Regardless of that, you still would need to file a tax court petition to challenge our position by a certain date. The date they gave was after the date that the petition had to be filed. It wasn't way after, but it was, you know, about a week after the date she had to file her petition. In reliance on that date, she filed a petition on that date. The Third Circuit found that, again, it was a jurisdictional matter. And jurisdictional matters are strictly construed. And once the 90th day passes, the tax court has no ability to hear that case. So she had no right to rely on the tax court's computation. Now, sometimes we get in that position where we have 90 day letters running and the taxpayer maybe is going to consider filing on their own a small tax court case, you know, for whatever reason to do that. Maybe their theory is they'll file that and then maybe they'll get it in appeals, whatever happens at that point. But remember that 90 day after that 90 day, you lose your right to file in tax court. You need to not necessarily just use the IRS's computation. Make sure someone verifies that computation by adding 90 to the actual date that is the measuring date. You know, find the real measuring date. When was the notice of deficiency issued? When was the final determination given, for instance, spouse relief, and compute the date? 
If you rely on the IRS date and it turns out they're wrong, it's just tough luck. Finally, we're going to look at a case involving deposits. Now, deposits are allowed in 66603 to stop the running of interest on a tax liability. So this is the taxpayers under exam and the taxpayer thinks they're, you know, if they lose this, they might owe $50,000 in tax. So what they think is rather than do that $50,000, rather than, you know, have this go on for five years through all the courts and then be stuck suddenly with interest compounding daily on a 50 grand, can I just put the 50 grand on deposit with the service and saying, if I owe you, you've got the money, but if I don't owe you, you'll refund that back. And the law provides for that. It allows the IRS to establish, uh, to establish rules for allowing that to happen. You're allowed to deposit up to the maximum amount that reasonably could be assessed on the return. So whatever that might be, you can make that deposit. But the question here is, what if you deposit it, let's say, for Corporation A that you control, but it's actually determined later on when all when the dust settles that Corporation B is the one who's truly liable for this tax. Can I take my deposit that was made by A and ask the service to move it to B and still treat it as paid on the date that A gave them that money? They had the money. Shouldn't we be able to move it to another taxpayer by request? Well, you might think again, it's fair. It would be fair to do that, wouldn't it? Well, bad news. Life sometimes isn't fair, or at least the IRS's view of life, of the results of life won't be fair. This is Field Attorney Advice 2017-1801F, issued on May the 5th. In this case, the IRS rules the original payer, there's nothing in the regulations, and the IRS under the code is allowed to write the rules here. There's nothing in the regulation allowing it to go to a different person. The person who makes the deposit is the only person whose tax can be that you can use to pay with the deposit. True, you obviously can ask for the money back, which you can, because that's the point. You can't any time prior to assessment. And then you can send it back over to pay the other tax, but you know the interest is still going to run on the other side. The problem with that is, as I note, if you have multiple taxpayers that are related, this means you're going to have to make a deposit for each taxpayer who might be subject to it. This was a case of transferee liability. And it turns out that a different transferee was picked to be liable than the one that had paid the deposit. Uh, don't know if the IRS is right on this because it is just their opinion, a field attorney advice. But, you know, you've got to argue against that and litigate if you want to try to get out of the interest. So bottom line, take care. We kind of know the service's position on this one now. Well, it's time to, again to consider signing up for your courses. So I want to remind you, those of us here at the Los Galazo Institute do live continuing education courses around the country all during the season. We do them generally for your state society of CPAs. So check your state CPA society to find the courses offered. We're offering them. Your society also offers courses by other vendors that are, I'll admit, they're excellent too. So take a look. Be sure to check your state society's list for courses coming up. Now is the time to sign up and get us get your get yourself together, ready for the year. And as I mentioned before, by doing that, that makes it more likely your society will know early on that they're going to that the course will have enough people to make it worthwhile to turn to present the course. And that can make a huge difference in the cost of the course, you know, of the cost of airfare, et cetera. It can make the difference between a course being able to be presented and one not being able to be presented simply because if we know how many people are coming early enough, the airfare we you know is going to be reasonable. When you get real close to the date, if you wait till like a week or two before to do it, the airfare may itself make it impossible. You know, we're talking about it's not it's not actually out of the realm of possibility to see differences of thousand dollars go thousand to fifteen hundred dollars in airfare just by having it come a week later. And obviously, if you figure out what you know what is being charged for the courses, that's going to require adding more bodies in the room just to be able to pay for the airfare to get an instructor out there. So, yeah, consider signing up early. This has been the current federal tax developments for our week of May 15th. Be sure to catch our daily updates that we post at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. You can also download a PDF with articles on all of today's topics on our weekly update page. If you have any questions or comments, you can send it to me, Ed Zollers at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. And you can follow me on Twitter. You'll find me there at, at Ed Zollers. 
Look forward to seeing you next week as we'll talk about what's been going on in the area of taxes and what takes place in the coming week in taxes.